about the exam. Uh, the approach was pretty good. Uh, I was pretty pleased with the approach. Some of you did very well in the exam. Um, others did not do as well. Um, and many uh, have passed by my office and uh, expressed their disappointment with their performance in the exam. It's just one exam. It's not the end of the world. But I have noticed from my conversation with many of the people who passed by my office that they are going through the exam and they believe they are not going to do well in the exam. And this is not the approach to sit for any exam, whether it is comes to 11 or any other course that you are taking. You need just an exam, it's not. You need to go, and you should, go to any exam, having in mind that you will score 100 on the exam. If you go to any exam and you have in mind that I'm gonna get a 60 in the exam, that's not the right attitude to sit for any exam. You know, um, this time is the best time of your life, the college time. Then, trust me, you're gonna look back at it and then you will see how much you're gonna miss these days. So you need to enjoy it. You need to enjoy the exam, you need to enjoy studying, you need to enjoy life. But if you are in a state where you are shivering coming to a class or shivering, going, taking any exam, you're not going to enjoy the best time of your life, which is right now. I'm going to tell you a, a, an encounter that happened. I have mentioned this story before, but I'm going to share it with you. You know, um, most of you are pre medical students, and the biggest exam that you're going to take is the AMPA. So there was this girl who was trying to get a seat in Lebanon for her anta, and she was not able to get a seat, so she had to travel to Germany. And uh, of course, everybody, uh, before going to, uh, to the anta, you have this uh, big fear what you are going to do on the anta. And she decided, she was telling me, she decided that, you know, so what? It's just an exam. The day before, I want to spend the day shopping. <laughs> and she went around, and she spent the whole day just going around in Germany, in Frankfurt, I believe, and she was just shopping. The second day, she got up very early in the morning. And uh, she put makeup, she made her hair, she was telling me this, and she dressed up as if she was going to a party, not to the Amtab. It was just an exam. And she went to the Amtab and she aced the Amtab. She aced it. She got very, very high scores. With the old Amtab scores, she got 14 out of 15 and 13 out of 15 and 10 over English. Now we have the new Amtab. I'm not suggesting to the males to put makeups before you go to the exam. <laughs> All I am saying is, when you go to an exam and you are prepared psychologically to sit for any exam, there is nothing that is hard. Any exam is an easy exam. The other thing that I have noticed from people passing by my office, they, are, they shared with me what other courses they are. And you guys, some of you, are really overloading yourself. And this is not the right approach. If you take five or 17 credits and all of these 17 credits are heavy courses, you're not gonna do as well in all of these courses. Now, some of you are doing, particularly medical lab. Who, who's medical lab, pre here? God help you. <laughs> you 
overload yourself with 17 credits every semester because you want to make it in three years. You want to take all your courses and you want to take the pre-medical courses and then it's just too much. So what if you finish it in four years? One year, two years, three years are nothing in the big picture. You're 19, 20, 18, it's nothing. So don't overload yourself. If you overload yourself, you're not going to do as well in all, and you're not going to enjoy your life. You're not going to enjoy the college. The college. The other thing that I have noticed that people are taking the courses, they are believing to be pre-medical students, they are pre-med students, but they don't want to be pre-med students. So why are you pre-med then? Because my father told me, my mother told me, my cousin, my neighbor, the doorman, the janitor, I don't know why. You have to go for a major that you love. If you don't go for something that you are in love with, hence organic chemistry, the science of love. <laughs> if you don't go for a major that you love, that you get up very early in the morning and you can't just wait to dress, to go and attend class or go for the job you are taking, you're not gonna be happy. Certainly, you're not gonna be happy in whatever career you're gonna choose. You need to be in love with what you're doing. If you're not in love with what you're doing, that's not the career that you should pursue. I'll give you another example. There was this pre-med girl, her father is a physician, very uh, well-established physician here as a, at AUBMC, and um, he was, uh, he believed that biology is the best major for his daughter to go into medical school. And she was pre-med biology a couple of years ago, and she was not happy at all. She was not doing well. She was not doing well in the course, and she was getting good grades, but she was not happy. She was not doing well in that major. And I insisted on him that I meet this girl. And she passed by my office. And I talked to her about the courses that she took before. And I discovered from my conversation with her that she is really enjoying psychology. The course she took before, she really enjoyed it. And she was sharing with me her experience in the psychology course. And I told her, that's the major you're going to go, psychology. That's the major you're going to pursue, psychology. It was not hard to convince her. It was very hard to convince her father, <laughs> which is expected. But he finally gave up, and he agreed that she would listen to my advice. And she did. She switched to psychology. She excelled in psychology. And she's, she's excelling right now in the medical school. If she had continued being biology, I don't think she would have been accepted in the medicals. I'll give you a third example. There was one guy who uh, was doing biology, and he graduated with high distinction from AUV. He applied to AUV Medical School. He was accepted. He was ranked among the top 10. He started medical school. At that time, the scores were uh, excellent, good, pass, fail. Now the, the grading system has changed. And he was getting E in all of his classes. A couple of months later, he submitted his resignation. He quit medical school. And then he sent me an email. He, he, he took to 11 with me and he took to 12 with me. To 11 he got 100, and to 12 he got 99. <laughs> Over so he wrote me an email asking for a letter of recommendation to go into business. So I told him, please pass on now. <laughs> and he did. And I 
I told her, why prison? First, my first question actually was, why did you quit medical school? And his answer was, and I quote, I did not enjoy it. And I quote. It was just, I did not like it. I said, why business? He said, well, my father has business. I just take the business. I'll get business major, and then I'll pursue. I'll, I'll, I'll work with my father. What was supposed to be a five minute meeting ended up into a two hour meeting between me and him. And I convinced him that no, you're not gonna go into business, you are gonna go into graduate studies. And it was already, you know, end of the almost end of the fall semester. So to make the long story short, I switched him into chemistry. He was biology. <laughs> into a, one particular field, which is called for chemical sciences. And I told them, we can get you somewhere. We can get you a assistantship. Um, here, they call it WASTA. In the US, they call it recommendation. So faculty members here, of course, all of us, we have connections. If we write an email, one line or two lines, we can get people accepted because some people, they trust us. And that's exactly what I did with him. He said that, well, I don't know organic. I told him I train you. You will start working in my lab tomorrow. And he did. So we trained him for six months. He went on for a PhD. And then he did a postdoc. And now he's a faculty member at LEU. He is actually the youngest faculty member at LEU. A couple of years ago, he joined us. Medicine was not this case. He is now a professor of inorganic chemistry at LA. You guys, it's still too early. There is no problem changing careers, pathways. I have another, I have so many examples. <laughs> One of my, uh, my, my classmates, he used to be physics major and pre math. He used to come to class back in the 90s, before you were born, <laughs> wearing a shirt, and he has Einstein. That's how much he was lo in love with, with physics. And uh, he actually got into medical school here at the UB. And then he went to Iowa, and he did residency in cardiology. And he did, uh, he is practicing right now. He's a cardiologist in Iowa, in the US. And then a couple of months ago, uh, but he was still in love with physics. And he keeps sharing articles about astronomy, about physics, about Einstein, about uh, And rarely he will share articles about medicine or cardiology. A couple of months ago, he sent me a message uh, saying that, you know, I want to go for graduate studies in physics. I told him, not surprised. I keep talking about you in my lectures. <laughs> and the question was, when are you going to go for this PhD? So we had back and forth uh, conversation. And he is now in the process of submitting uh, applications to start after his MD and after being a cardiologist for uh, many years um, to go and do uh, a master's first in physics and then PhD. My advice to him was like, you know, you should do uh, physics that is related to cardiology so that you can make use of your physics major and your medical field, and so on. I can tell you stories for the next six, seven hours, and they will, they will never end. <laughs> the bottom line, it's not too early to find out what you like, what you love, not like. And you go for it. If you're not able to convince your parents, I'll give you my mobile number, I can convince <laughs> I have done that before. Well, and here's another story, now that I remember the phone. So this one girl who was chemistry major and she was my advisee. My advisee, so she was taking <laughs> biology 201, chemistry 201, and uh, I think math 201 and two uh, humanities. 
uh, English and one humanity. So right before the deadline to withdraw for you guys, it's today. I was able to convince them to, co to postpone it. The reason I, I did that is so that I talked to you before you drop any portion during this lecture. So this girl, she came to me right uh, uh, two days before the deadline to withdraw, and she told me that she want to withdraw biology to OR, chemistry to OR. I was like, why? And she said, she's not doing why. Not in biology to OR, not in chemistry to OR. What about the other courses? She was not doing well in the other courses as well. And she was, she was unhappy. You can, uh, you can see it very easily. I was able to see it. Uh, very easily back then. And uh, after my conversation with her, I told her my advice to you is to drop the semester. <laughs> to drop the entire semester. It was her first semester at AUB. My, the, the, the reason for my advice was, well, you're, they could let you drop two, two courses after finishing and going below 12 credits because it is a first semester. But the other three courses you're not doing well in them, either you're gonna fail or you're gonna get low 60s. So basically, you are having on your record low 60s, and that's gonna affect your average for the rest of your stay at AUB. You know, um, your uh, grade report is like in Lebanon, the civil, uh, uh, right? So you need to clean it up. Now, the more you put bad grades, the, the, the harder it's going to be for you to get your grades to a point where they are not going to affect your career. Of course, uh, that is a, a major decision she had to share with her father. I don't give my cell phone number to students. I did give her my cell phone number, except the people working on my team, they have my phone number. And they call me at midnight, blah, 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 and that's fine. <laughs> and then just a few minutes later, her father called me. So well, what kind of advice are you giving my daughter? And then I explained to her. And uh, I told them, uh, this is not the major that she should pursue. She should go to another major. And uh, based on my conversation with her, she um, was in love with business. It's like, so what do we do? It's like, you, she was thrown from all courses. There will be no record at all that she took any of these courses. And then we start over. We start fresh. And we take the courses to transfer to business. Second semester. I told her what are the courses that she registered for these courses. And she was placed on the deans on her list. And second semester, she moved into business, and she graduated a couple of years ago. I have the record, the entire record. I, I write this. I keep record of all this. These are just a few examples. Now, for you guys, this is just an example. Now, the, the, what you need to do is to assess why you did not do well. If you did not do well because you did not study that we know what is the problem. And a couple of people came to my office yesterday and they told me that I didn't do well <coughs> because I, I, I did not study, for example. But you stop right there. The reason is right there. You didn't study. If you did not study and you didn't do well, that's expected. Now, if you studied, but not in the right way, meaning you did not practice enough, well, we can address it. The problem will be if you study very well and you practice very well, and when you go to the question, you see the questions, you still believe your answer is the correct answer. Then we have a problem. This means you did not understand the material. You have conceptual uh, misunderstanding of the material that we are talking. And we are going to address that when you have the chance to look at it. I'm going to stop right here, and then we will carry on now with chapter 6.